going to be recording. We're going to be recording this session so those um, folks who registered and were not able to attend will be able to um, get caught up and if they join us later. So thank you so much for joining us in our session two, um, our learning community series on families um, and, and really taking the time to understand how our families serve as well as our service members. Um, so today we're gonna specifically talk about the impact of trauma on the family. So without further ado, let's get right on into this. I have the pleasure of being your uh, moderator for today's call. My name is Tish McCullough and I actually reside in Texas. Um, and I am a project associate with the SMBFTA Center. Um, just as a matter of refer reference, I'm a retired uh, combat army veteran and um, really am so thankful for this series um, and these amazing speakers that we're gonna have joining us today. Um, the disclaimer for today, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Just a couple of things to review as we continue on. Um, we do, you guys had some homework to do. So we're gonna take some time to look at some of the objectives and things that you uh, worked on in series one. Um, and we have some amazing objectives for today's session as well. We're gonna take the time to do some introductions. And as I mentioned about the homework, we have one poll question, and then we're gonna get right into um, the caregiver's perspective from Sean Moore. Then we're gonna have a facilitated discussion uh, related to that. And then we have our amazing Dr. Gregory Laskin, who will be talking to us about um, children and youth and supporting our military families. Again, we'll have a facilitated discussion. Oh, sorry. And um, go on to next steps and assign you with your new homework for next session. So we're a fairly small group today, which is amazing in its own right, because we can probably have a little more open conversation. Um, but uh, we, what I would ask you to do is when we do um, have opportunity to have an open discussion, if you could just identify yourself when you speak, um, mute your computers and phones when you're not speaking, and then please participate, uh, and that we're gonna get the most out of it when we do that. And then be sure that we're keeping others in mind and be respectful. Um, as for some of us who serve in the military and as a family member, this may be the first opportunity for us to be actually talking about what it means to be a family member and this platform um, of, of how we feel about um, our service to the military community. So here are just a few of the learning objectives for the entire um, session today. We're gonna illustrate how military and veteran family lives uh, can be impacted by trauma and secondary um, vicarious trauma, trauma. We're going to demonstrate concrete strategies for supporting caregivers and preventing burnout. Um, we're also gonna identify resources to support parents and children dealing with trauma. So what I would really like to do now is, let me get your pictures where I can see. We have a couple of folks with us. We have Angie Prater, and please forgive me in advance for you know slaughtering your names. Uh, if you could just say who you are, maybe what team you're coming from, and if you happen to work for an agency. Sure, you had it perfect. My name is Angie Prater. Um, I am an outpla outpatient clinician. I work with Matt Rogers Community Services in Virginia. We're kind of the southwestern end of Virginia. Um, and also I work as a part of VMAP, which is the Virginia Mental Health Access Program, where we do consultation for pediatric and primary care offices in the state. Very good. Thank you so much. And then we have Amanda Kirby. Hello, yeah, um, 
I go by Mandy Kirby. I also work at Mount Rogers uh, Community Service Board and I'm an outpatient clinician with adults um, in our Withville office. Well, great. Thank you for being here with us. Now, um, just for um, you guys to know, the other folks who are on the line are either your guest speakers or they're with the SMB FTA Center. But I wanna go ahead and introduce them because they come to the table with their own perspectives and it might be helpful in this conversation. So if you don't mind, Quinn, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Quinn Galloway Salazar. Um, and I serve as the co-director of the SMBFTA Center. I live in the state of Georgia. I am an Army veteran, and I'm also a spouse to a combat retired veteran. Thank you. And then we have our, our resident Marine number two, uh, Don Harris. You're muted. Muted. Um, thanks again, Tish. Don Harris, Senior Project Associate with the SMVFTA Center. Uh, as Tish stated, a uh, veteran of the Marine Corps, also married to a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. So, um, and we're up here in upstate New York, beautiful upstate New York. So uh, good to meet everyone or good to see you again for some of those. <laughs> thanks, Don. And then we have Jay Sher Blocker. You're muted. Good afternoon, everybody. Jason Blocker here, project associate with the TA Center. Um, happy to be a part of this conversation as I am a sibling of two, um, two veterans. So um, I'm not a veteran myself, but I am here and supporting and ready to ready to dive in. Thanks, Tish. Yep, thanks, Jay Sher. And then Aaron. Do you want to say hi? Aaron is also our tech for today, our amazing tech. So if you run into any technical issues, um, such as your electricity cutting out, please, you know, just ping him. Well, knock on wood, let's hope that doesn't happen, Tish. Well, thank you so much for bringing me up here. Uh, like Tish said, my name's Aaron Moshman. Uh, I'm a project uh, assistant with uh, service members and veterans in the Family Technical Assistance Center. And like Tish said, I'm gonna be running tech for y'all. So if you run into any sort of tech uh, issues, uh, pending your power doesn't go out, please just let me know and I'll do everything I can to get you up and connected. I get that all, uh, all of us being virtual might be a bit stressful, but don't worry about that. We're here for you and we'll get you connected anywhere we can. Thank you, Erin. Okay, well, let's kind of, let's get into it here. So for, um, you know, Angie and Mandy, um, we're going to be sort of picking on you because you're the two folks from the state teams. Um, but we're going to, I promise you won't be bad picking. We're going to do this together. Um, but last time we were together, we had some homework. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot, but were you able to do the survey? Okay, sorry, I could not get myself back to full screen. Um, yeah, I did actually, I went and reviewed the site a little bit and looked at it. I know we talked about it some too um, during the training as well. Um, I honestly do not know anything about the governor or mayor's challenge team. You know, that's a term that I wasn't really aware of before we had this training. Um, I know I shared last time, you know, we do, in our kind of intake process screening, um, ask those questions, you know, about link to, you know, military, if you're a veteran for family services. Um, but beyond that, if there's not, you know, when I do an intake as a clinician, if there's not, you know, resources that needed to be provided to that individual or family, you know, there's not much more that I do as far as, um, you know, those resources mm -hmm. in my role. But I do know that we do have a program within Mount Rogers that focuses on, um, you know, veteran families. It would be kind of a process that I, you know, just kind of link them to at that point. Okay. And is that something that you kind of echo, Mandy? Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm also a clinician, so I do the assessments. We always ask if, you know, the client is a veteran currently in the military or, if they're um, a dependent of 
okay. in the military, but like she said, we would just be linking to services at that point. We don't directly, but now the clients that we treat, I do see clients that for outpatient counseling that do have history in the military. Okay. Very good. Very good. I think I would just like to pick up or mention just a couple of things because of what you guys both do. Um, you know, I know that words matter. Um, the vernacular that we use can be triggering for some folks and or maybe um, prevent them from taking the next step into to doing uh, whatever treatment or, you know, care that they need for themselves. So the one thing that I um, picked up, um, especially for those of us who were in the military a long time ago, um, we called our family members dependents. And that stuck around for a long, 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 long time. And now, um, because the family of the military service has recognized that being a dependent could have kind of a negative connotation, they've moved away from dependent and basically you're just saying family member. Um, and so, Sean, I see you doing some north and south there. I, I can tell you, you know, that there's some contentious conversations that I've I've been a part of about that. So that's one thing I think that learning to use the most current um, vernacular can really help as we're doing assessments and providing the care for folks that they need. And then um, I also wanted to mention Angie on the Blue Star Family Survey. Um, I actually did it myself as being a, a veteran or active duty a veteran and then a family member thereof, um, I went ahead and did the survey so that I could kind of see like, what are we asking um, the family members to do? And so I would encourage you, the survey is not closed yet. So even though it was homework from the last time, maybe going, it took me like maybe, if I had been uninterrupted, it would have taken me about 10 minutes at the most to do, but I was multitasking as usual. So it was really kind of good because some of the questions that were asked in the survey made me think about other things. So just throwing it out there, maybe take the time to, um, to review that. Um, but there was some questions that were in that survey that were direct, directly related to how did they, how did you feel within the community of military community and your civilian community? There were some direct questions related to if you were from a family where um, the parents and the children were of mixed races and there were a lot of um, uh, equity and inclusion questions in there related to military service and community um, relating to the community now as a veteran family. Um, so it was very interesting and I, and I really would appreciate it. And even the folks that are on here from the team take the survey or at least take a look at the survey in the website because it's very helpful. Um, okay. We'll definitely do that. I will just, I, I think I looked at the previous survey, not the active one. Like I read the results kind of a little more after that training. Mm -hmm. um, so I will go back. I will take it. I noticed it, it looks like it's open for a few more days. It is. I just took it today. So, I mean, I think it was really helpful and I think it sort of framed what maybe has changed from the from the findings from the previous survey to the findings for or the survey for now. So anyway, that was really good um, there. Any any comments? Um, anyone else have any comments related to particularly the homework? OK, great. Let's. Uh, so we have a poll question. And um, the way that we're going to respond to the poll question is to use our chat function. So what is your level of understanding of trauma and its impact on the military and veteran families? And options are completely green, some basic knowledge, solid background, or this is what you do day in and day out. Let's see what we get. I know for me, I'm answering solid background. I don't consider myself to be an expert. Gotcha, gotcha. I would expect people like Dr. Laskin and maybe Sean Moore 
this is kind of the thing that they do. Um, very good. Well, thank you. Basic knowledge, solid background. Very good. Well, this is good because I think this gives our presenters a little bit of an idea where we are as they um, do their presentations and, and what lens we're looking at it from. All right, so we are gonna get into it here. I'm gonna take a moment to um, introduce you to Sean Moore. She is the LMSW and is the executive director and founder of Caregivers on the Home Front. And if that's not an exciting title, I don't know what is. Um, Ms. Moore recently graduated with a Master of Social Work degree from Park University and is licensed in the state of Missouri. She was a 14-year veteran with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Uh, she is a Missouri Dole Caregiver Fellow alumna alum, uh, from <laughs> Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Since May of 2013, Sean has been a caregiver for her husband, who is a 23-year Army veteran. She has a passion for supporting and advocating for military and veteran family caregivers. She was awarded the Field Education Student of the Year for 2018-19 with Park University. Ms. Moore is a member of Phi Alpha, help me out here. Epsilon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Honor Society and was the 2019-2020 president at um, Park University. She is a certified peer mentor and facilitator with the Red Cross Military and Caregiver Network. She is also a peer mentor with the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs Caregiver Program. She was chosen as a Caregiver Visionary winner for Caregiving.com in 2019. Sean openly shares her caregiver story through the United, throughout the United States in hopes that all family caregiver givers will be recognized for the work that they do in taking care of their wounded veterans. Sean has four daughters, two stepsons, and four grandchildren, um, and she enjoys reading and traveling. Now, I'm telling you, I am really looking forward to hearing from you, Sean, and um, I'm going to uh, turn off me and my dove and turn it over to you. Okay, and you're gonna advance my slides, correct? Yes, okay, perfect. Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be here today on what I um, believe is one of the most important topics when we're talking about military and veterans because I'm a family member and I work with family members who are caregivers of our, of our wounded and ill veterans and service members. And, and I think I have a little bit of a different perspective because, because I not only live the life every day, but I also put myself in this role as an executive director and support other veteran caregivers, but then went back to school to get a master's. So I wasn't just speaking from the lens of a caregiver, but I was also able to move that lens to a, a professional standpoint, which I believe gives, um, well, at least I know that we're putting our programs together appropriately in, in this uh, nonprofit that I put together. Next slide. So here's the uh, objectives and we've already talked about that. So next slide. So for those of you that have never heard about the, this RAND study, uh, and I know those at SAMHSA have, but for those of you that may not, this is a wonderful, wonderful research that was put together through the RAND um, Corporation that was commissioned by the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. And it was the first of its kind. If you really dive deep into research in regard to family caregivers of military and veterans, you are not gonna find very much. And I say that because most every one of my papers and my uh, master's program, I wanted to be centered around family caregivers of military and veterans, and I couldn't hardly find anything. So I use this quite 
quite frequently, but it gave us um, as caregivers on the home front gaps that were out there that military and veteran caregivers told us about and then we were able to put together our programs appropriately. So if you don't know, which I, I, I believe most of you probably have heard, there are 5.5 million Americans who care for injured or ill service members and veterans. And those could be service members and veterans who you see that have injuries or those that you don't. If you can believe this, caregivers provide $14 billion of uncompensated care each year. That's a lot. And when we're talking about our state and governor's challenge teams, this is where they can help in regard to policies because that uncompensated care leads into the caregiver burden, the caregiver burnout, because they aren't being appropriately compensated for what they're doing behind the scenes. They experience worse health outcomes and greater strains in family relationships and more workplace problems than non-caregivers. And here's why. So most of the post 9-11 caregivers fare worse in these areas too. So the RAND study goes on to say that the key aspects of caregiving contribute to depression, including time spent away giving care, so time spent giving care, and helping the care recipient cope with behavioral problems. And perhaps even the greater concern here is between 12% of pre-9-11 caregivers and 33% of post-9-11 caregivers, they lack health care. They lack health care coverage suggesting that they face added barriers to getting help in mitigating the potentially negative effects of caregivers. So if they lack health care, that means that they're not getting the mental health care that leads into depression, anxiety, or secondary traumatic stress. That's a big deal. And when we're talking about our, our governors and um, governor's challenges, our mayoral's challenges, um, committees, that's where that you can put policies in place that help mitigate that. So in a sample of 458 caregivers, 39% experienced interruptions in their education. I did. And 23.6% reported suicidal ideation since becoming a caregiver. And that's what we really need to look at. How is caregiving affecting the mental health of these caregivers, these family members? And we, you know, caregivers is a term that many of these family members don't even associate with because they don't know they're a caregiver. And if you think about this, many of our caregivers of military and veterans are in their late 20s and early 30s. Think about how long they're going to be caregiving. And then as a couple of you said, you're, you're clinicians, right? So how long on the stretch of caregiving are they gonna be on? So it's when we think military and veteran caregivers, we can't think just elderly. We have to think younger people as well. So I love that Tish brought up that you're from Texas. So caregivers on the home front just got back from Texas to bring our mental health and wellness restorative weekend to 14 caregivers all from Texas. Now, oftentimes we know in the research that our veterans, our military service members, when they go off to war and they come home with PTS, PTSD, um, anxiety, many of them have childhood trauma. And their military service was a catalyst trigger, if you will, that threw them into post-traumatic stress. Let me tell you about some of the trauma that these caregivers over the weekend had. House fires, loss of a child, children with cancer, they themselves lived through childhood abuse. 
they had abusive prior husbands, uh, their prior husbands were abusive. Those with, that they're living with today, their spouses have PTSD and TBI. One of the symptoms is anger. Many of them have been verbally abused. Many of their veterans have attempted suicide. So not only do they have trauma associated with their loved one's military career, they have trauma too. They have trauma too. So like the catalyst of war for our veterans, the catalyst for a lot of these caregivers is their caregiving. And if they have never been supported in their own trauma, then they're not being supported today in their caregiving. I know um, Dr. Delgado presented um, or is getting ready to present. I think she presented last time. But anyway, um, if you haven't read her study in regard to suicidality and caregivers, please do. That's something we don't talk about a lot but the suicidality is there and putting safety plans together for these caregivers and family members is so important. They oftentimes do not get asked. Of the 14 caregivers that were there this last weekend, when I handed out a safety plan, not one of them had ever filled one out, but their loved one had. Next slide. So some strategies for supporting our caregivers. Our, our state teams and our local teams, they need to have a one-stop place to list resources specific to caregivers. Oftentimes on our state veteran um, websites, they list only veteran resources or military associated resources. You've got to dig deep here. There's resources out there for the caregivers and family members. Put those on there as well and make sure you're getting that out. It can't be just a veteran website of resources. It's got to be a veteran and family member resources or your family members aren't even going to look. You've got to give opportunities for caregivers to meet each other. Many times as veterans are isolated, so is their family. And if these teams and your local organizations aren't providing opportunities for caregivers to meet, and it can be virtually, they think they're all alone. They have no idea what they're going through. Someone else is as well. It normalizes their situation so they can talk about it. And we know that they've got to be able to talk about it. Include caregivers and family members in your job fairs. It can't be just veteran job fairs. It's got to be veterans and family members, as well as your higher education opportunities. Many of our colleges and universities have veteran resource centers. Make that family member resource centers as well. Where I went, we were able to change that at Park University. And now their warrior center is not only targeting veterans and military service members, they're targeting caregivers and they say caregivers, it's absolutely wonderful. If you don't have a caregiver, an Elizabeth Dole fellow on your team or in your organization, if you're not reaching out to a caregiver fellow from the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, they're in every state they are the premier source of information in your states. Next slide. So we wanna train providers in inclusive care. Inclusive care is a um, program a, that was put together by the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and Veterans Affairs. I have presented on inclusive care and it's what it is, is bringing that caregiver, that family member, to the care team. We all know that the veteran or the service member lives most of their time at home. And if we're not bringing that care member, that family member who's the caregiver to the team, you may miss, be missing some key, key things that are going on at home that you're never gonna know about in therapy or, or you're never gonna know about that they're, they've been in pain because, you know, our veterans, we talk about stigma. 
We've got to get our caregivers at the table. Our policy makers, we want to protect and expand state and local support programs. We also want to expand respite to our veteran and military caregivers. They need time to get away. And if those programs at the state and local level aren't providing that, they're not getting that. And employers, if you're an employer and you're targeting family members, offer them paid family leave and give them flexible work schedules. I need to go to some of my husband's appointments at the VA. When I was a police officer, the reason why I'm not anymore is because as you can imagine, it was really hard to be a police officer and go, hey, I need to get home. My loved one just called and he's suicidal. When you're sitting on a murder scene, kind of doesn't work. So we've got to be able to make sure that we provide our caregivers with some flexible work schedules. Next slide. So here's some support resources for family and caregivers. And when I talk about um, what our caregivers or what I've gone through, if you've read my story, um, you can go to our website. No, my story is not unique. My husband since October of last year was inpatient four times. All those times, there was an attempt prior to that. What was the focus on? him, he's the patient, but you know, at some point in time, he's going to be sent home. Is the family strong enough? Can you imagine what they went through? I, ha I have a child, a 10 year old. How do we explain those things to our kids? So that secondary stress, that second secondary traumatic stress is there. And that's a term that many caregivers don't know. We need to make sure that we are educating our caregivers. For the clinicians on the call, asking not only if a veteran, if you have served, but if you or a loved one has served, will open up many, many areas to explore. And when I tell you many of them are abused verbally, they don't know how to set boundaries. Caregiving becomes their only identity and they lose themselves. If we are not paying attention to these caregivers, we're not paying attention to the whole entire veteran family unit. And we know that veterans don't heal in a vacuum. They heal around their families. We've got to get them involved as well. I could talk forever and I'm not going to this time. So um, I believe the, the next slide is just um, the facilitated discussion. So with that, I'm gonna end it and take any questions or comments. And I'm going to stop sharing because um, for this facilitated discussion, I want to kind of like just have a talk about it. Um, you know, I just want to take the um, opportunity to mention a couple of things that that came up for me while you were talking. One is um, that many of our military families are dual military families, which means that you have the family aspect and you have whatever happened during that military service. And then the family aspect and where it happened during your spouse or your you know, partner's military service. So it could get quite tricky um, when, when trying to figure out you know, how do we stay healthy as a family given the dual military families. Um, and then also, you, know, you brought up another really great point about having to choose to leave your career to be able to support your veteran. And um, so I just think that those are really two, they happen all the time. It happens all the time. And most often in, in my experience, I have seen the family members, the one giving up their career or their occupation or job to support that veteran or service member in that recovery. Um, so those are a couple of things that, I, that came up for me. I wanna open the floor to see um, are there any questions that you guys would like to ask Sean 
or comments or, or anything you'd like to offer um, to add to the discussion that we just had? Tish, I want to um, comment on a couple of your, your comments as well. So in our mental health and wellness restorative weekends that um, we put together that is, is free of charge, and it, it's all about the mental health and wellness of the caregiver that comes, that family member. We don't talk about the veteran. and But I will tell you, many that come are veterans as well. And what I have found most interesting, and I know this as a female police former police officer, but many probably will not um, recognize that most of those women will identify as a caregiver, but they will not identify as a veteran until we bring it up because of course, you know, the facilitators, we know that they're a veteran too. And I always think that's very interesting. And then um, one of the things that we talk about I'm not a police officer anymore, but I found a different way. And that's so important. We know that's important for our veterans. It's important for our family members as too. It, it is important for family members too. And that's why we talk about the identity piece. Caregiving as a role, it, it's not, it cannot become your total identity. And for many caregivers, it does. And it really sets them up for failure because we're not gonna be caregivers forever. Thank you for sharing that. It, it also, I, I wanted to be sure to thank you. And I'm gonna go and read your story. It's intriguing, um, you know, to me uh, as, a, as, a, as a veteran who also lost a, an ex-spouse to suicide, um, knowing that struggle and how that affects the family members in that struggle, um, my kids. And so absolutely. So thank you for sharing that and thank you for what you're doing. Any other questions or comments or anything anybody want to add to this conversation? I'm definitely going to check out those resources. Um, I do appreciate, you know, we live in a very rural area in Virginia, and so resources are very scarce. Um, my father's actually a veteran of the Navy, and probably about a decade ago now, he became disabled um, and then had a stroke. And so, you know, I, I actually just personally as an LCSW helped him find resources and get him connected with the VA because he had not previously utilized, you know, the benefits from the military because he didn't need them. Um, and I will say around the time that we went through that, the VA process was very different than it is today. I mean, it has come a long way and I have wonderful things to say about the VA, but still, you know, I see the impact on my mom because the VA is an hour and a half from us here where we live. And so the time she has to take off to take him to appointments, you know, we recently sought out counseling for both of them and trying to navigate, you know, how to get the family counseling piece to include my mom. It's like, she's a part of it with him, but not for herself, what she really needs. Um, and so I'm just really excited, you know, that um, was it Elizabeth Hope or whatever, that resource I definitely want to check into. Um, but, you know, those are the things personally I've kind of experienced with it and trying to help them navigate getting the supports that they need. And while it's come a long way, I feel like especially in our area, you know, we definitely could be doing more because, you know, if in my personal life, that's how I'm navigating it. You know, professionally, I think, you know, learning those resources and you know, helping these families access it is going to be really important too. Yeah, I think that you hit the um, hit, hit the nail with the hammer in regard to it. It's such a interesting aspect when you are a professional in this space, as well as you know, you you are a you are a caregiver. Your mom's a caregiver, and not having those resources, but you know how to navigate them. You know, I know how to navigate them. Many don't. And um, it, it's up to us to make sure that not only the veterans are getting those resources, but we've got to dig a little bit deeper in getting those resources for the caregivers. The Elizabeth Dole Foundation does have a great network of resources on their page that they have vetted. Um, so definitely look into that. 
The Elizabeth Dole ha Foundation also has a respite relief program that is just for the caregiver. Um, so check that out as well. That's on their, their website. Um, there are some great resources out there. Thank you. One of the things when, when you mentioned about um, being a, a professional um, and being in this space all the time, uh, I just want to be transparent. You know, like I've been in this role, I'm helping um, veterans and families for over 10 years. But when it happens to your family, you forget everything that you would recommend for someone else. And so I say that to say, as providers, we need to ensure that we're being sensitive as we're communicating to that person that's finally reaching out or finally got the right number to get to us, that we're, we're treating them with sort of those kid gloves because it's been a real terrible hard journey just to get to the person who can actually help them out. So I just wanted to throw that out there um, for you. Um, and I also want to encourage um, Angie and Mandy to, we're going, we need to get you connected to your governor's challenge in Virginia. Um, because if, yeah, I really think that it's really important that you are um, and learning the resources that they have available as well. Because they have some things that may be able to complement the programs that you already have in place related to um, military cultural training. You know, there's a whole bunch of things. So I'm so don't know how you got to this webinar, but I'm glad that you did. <laughs> Any other comments or uh, input that we wanna add to this facilitated discussion? I just wanna ask one quick, quick. Well, first I wanna thanks. I wanna say thanks to you, um, Sean, for, for everything you shared. Um, good information. Um, good insight. In terms of the VA, I know the VA has been trying to make progress um, with caregivers overall, but where have you found that to stand um, in, the, in the whole landscape of things? Well, um, so I think there's good and bad. Um, I, I do believe they're coming a long way from when I first met my husband eight years ago to today. They have made some great strides. It is so, there are so many caregivers and, and their system is taxed, right? And we know that as, as a professional, I can say that, but when I, like Tish said, when I'm in the thick of it and can't get a social worker, I can't get um, a psychologist, I can't get his doctor to call me and, and, and clue me in on, um, what I need to do when he comes home, that's a problem. When I'm not at the meeting that I'm supposed to be at, when he discharges that suicide prevention meeting, that's a problem. And that's still happening. And, and I know better. So I have resources. I know how to advocate. But for those that don't, they, they're not speaking up so um, because they don't know that they can speak up. So that's what's really important. We are, as caregivers, if you're a caregiver in the VA stipend program, you're supposed to be at the table. But that's still not trickling down to everyone, every employee. Another thing that I've seen, if caregivers don't qualify for the stipend program, they think they're disqualified for the general program. So that's a misnomer out there. And we, we, as organizations, as clinicians, we need to get that out there. If they don't qualify for the stipend program, they can, they don't have to qualify for the general program. They can get in the general program. And there's many resources there for them. Um, as much, you know, we've come a long way, there's still always better to do, right? Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Last call. This is your alibi call. We're going to move on. If no one else um, has anything to, oh, I see Jessica Rose. Go ahead. I just want to say how much I love and appreciate these conversations and it needs to happen more and we need to be able to get more people to the table to have these conversations because 
our veterans, which are sometimes our caregivers, like we talked about, are only as strong as the support and resources they have. And I know many of us uh, know what that feels like to not have the resources and connections. And just like Sean, you shared, if it, if it weren't for me having the connections I have and knowing what I have, my husband wouldn't have the care that he has. So I think about all those other veterans and all those other caregivers and family members who, if they were in my shoes, what would have happened? What would have they been able to do? So there's definitely, we have come a long way like anything and there's still so much more work to do. And just having this conversation alone, I think it's a, it's a huge step and I appreciate it. Thanks, Man, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking up. I, you know, for all those, um, at Santa who are working with the governors and Merrill's teams, um, challenge teams, please, if they don't have family members on the teams, that's a huge disservice. Um, I'm a part of the Merrill's challenge, but guess what? I'm not a part of the governor's challenge. Why? Don't know, okay? That's a big problem. That's a big problem. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, Tish, I want to just share something real fast um, and, and just kind of piggyback off of what Jessica Rose was saying. Um, you know, I remember sitting in a room and Don, you probably remember this too, in 2018 at the Mayor's Challenge in DC. And Sean so fearlessly got up and said to an audience of about close to 300 people, if you all are gonna talk about service members, veterans and their families and SMVF, what about the F? And I like to say that that shifted the way we did business as a TA center, right? Yes, we always included families, but to an extent, and many of us are family members, but hearing that, made us really cognizant that we needed to do more. And so looking at it from a federal level and a state level and allowing that to trickle down to your local communities and your grassroots levels, it can be done. We are intentional every time we have an event to ensure that there is a family component. What about the F? We always, always. And you know, before we really knew it was a Sean Moore, it was the lady with the purple hair. We have to make sure <laughs> we don't forget about the F. And it's small steps, small steps you can take, just being aware of where the resources are. Look at the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Tish, I'll send you the study that um, Sean mentioned that Dr. Delgado just recently published. It's free access. She and her and her team ensured that it would be free to everyone specifically so that more people will understand and know what are um, those factors as it relates to suicide and, and um, caregivers and military families um, and not you know having folks have to be charged to get that. So we'll make sure that that resource is added, but take baby steps, take baby steps in your CSB and know that the folks here at the TA Center are here to help strategize with you one step at a time. Just, just asking the question, are you a family member? Are, have you served? Do you have children? What resources are available in your educational systems where you live? That starts the dialogue. Um, it doesn't have to be loads of money being pumped in a community to start the work. Having that compassion and having a core group of folks that can really move the needle, that's all it takes and the passion. And with that, I'm gonna shut my trap and Tish, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I love it. No, thank you so much. It's, it's important and that's how important it is. Um, and I love that you mentioned that we are very intentional um, now in the work that we're doing to include the F, the family member. And, and also with trying to identify who's the family member. You know, it doesn't have to be a blood relative. It's who, who feels that they are part of your family and who supported the family unit when they needed support. So I, I love that. Um, so thank you so much, Quinn. Um, we are going to uh, have our next guest speaker um, come up. And that is Dr. Gregory Leskin. 
who is the director um, at the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, Military and Veteran Families Program at UCLA Duke University National Center for Child Trauma and Stress. And Dr. Laskin is, Leskin is no stranger to the SMVFTA Center and the work that we love to collaborate with him on um, because of his expertise. And as you hear from him, you will see it's not only about what he knows, but how he delivers that is um, so helpful. Um, so just as a background information, uh, Dr. Leskin is a licensed clinical psychologist and serves as director of the Military and Veteran Families Program at the UCLA Duke University National Center for Child Traumatic Stress. In his, this capacity, Dr. Leskin directs the National Child Traumatic Stress Network Military and Veteran Families Program to provide education, training, and resources on military culture, screening, assessment, and evidence-based interventions to the military VA and community-based behavioral health providers throughout the United States. Dr. Leskin is the principal program developer and director for the NCTSN Department of Defense Academy on Child Trauma, an online training and social media platform developed to train DOD family advocacy program staff, clinical skills related to child trauma and behavioral health related prevention for military families and children. Um, and he has a little bit more to, a lot more to his resume than you can see that on the uh, announcement. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Luskin. Okay, thanks so much, Trish. Um, uh, Tish, I'm sorry. Uh, great way to start, like getting your name wrong, but uh, oh, wow. uh, go up from here. Can everyone see me? I hope you can see me, my video. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about um, the military child piece. So um, very important as we are talking with Sean about focus on the family and um, uh, part of the family is the children. So as, as Tish was just describing, my work um, has been, and you could take me to the next slide, please. Um, here we go. Uh, so my talk today is addressing child trauma in military and veteran uh, families and children. And I do serve as director for military and veteran families at the UCLA Duke National Center for Child Traumatic Stress. Here is my uh, uh, email. So if anyone here would like to uh, ever get in touch with me, uh, feel free to contact me at gleskin at mednet.ucla.edu. And I'd be happy to uh, share with you any of our resources through the NCTSN or the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. I could be your um, a guide to uh, network, what I would call network uh, resources and materials, including training materials across a wide variety of issues. My particular area is the support on the military and veteran uh, families piece. But before we move on, uh, what I'll be describing today are resources um, as well as insights and strategies that we've learned um, through many years of supporting military families, military children through the NCTSN, through our collaboration work with SAMHSA, the SMVFTA Center, of course, as well as DOD, uh, within DOD, the Uniform Services University Health Sciences, otherwise known as USHIS, a close partner of the NCTSN, to really develop um, um, what, what are the key insights in, in providing these services and support for military families and their children? So before we launch into what uh, we have uh, developed in terms of the resources, um, are the insights and strategies that have been developed in, in terms of how do we gauge family-based programs, either in the military or with the VA or in the community to support, support our families if they're referred to a community setting. And, and I, I'd like to speak to what are some of those top um, insights. The first I would say is um, collaboration. 
that this this work um, is is based on a collaboration um, across agencies at the highest level, federal agencies working together closely to be able to understand sort of the the the, the complex issues that can sometimes that family members and uh, military family and veteran, veteran families may face. So a collaboration across military uh, and VA and SAMHSA, but also our community and states. So this, this effort by the SMVF TA Center is a key and critical um, uh, uh, program to support that collaboration across our state teams and really reach into our communities to be able to bring resources, knowledge, um, and, and uh, really uh, essential technical assistance so that any community uh, can, can uh, uh, prepare itself, develop programs, not only to uh, identify or screen for um, military uh, uh, connectedness, service, uh, but also be able to uh, gauge well what, what kinds of interventions or resources can support our families and children. And the next, I think, is um, continuity. Um, that this effort, the effort we're talking about today, requires a continuous effort, that this is not a one and done uh, approach, that this effort to support our military families, our military children, is an effort that really does require a continuous dialogue as we're doing today. Um, one that will go on for many years, one that will uh, incorporate times that uh, our country is in the midst of uh, operations or combat, that there is high stress, high uh, tempo, but also times that maybe there's other, other uh, 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 kinds of pressures that military families might face. For example, uh, during the uh, pandemic and COVID, our military families faced um, uh, new, new types of uh, stressors um, related to movements or, or needing to stay in communities or respond to uh, coronavirus. So our efforts to support our military, our veterans and their families and their children is one that really requires a continuity. And the last, uh, I'll borrow from the military um, idea, is that this work requires a coordinated community response. That when issues occur, when there's problems, when there's uh, issues that military families or their kids are having, um, that um, this does require, even at the local level, kind of knowledge of services that are available uh, in your local area with the military, with family advocacy, with behavioral health, uh, with command, with uh, 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 the uh, military community, excuse me, the military criminal investigative uh, offices and uh, coordinated with community agencies, whether that's child welfare or pediatricians or community mental health, that there needs to be a knowledge of each other's services and uh, uh, an understanding of ways to work together. And I'd also say that that also um, uh, is relevant and is also important for our, v our veteran families and their children, maybe even more so that there's a, a, a level of coordination between our VA medical centers, our vet centers, and services at the local level so that, that we know uh, when referrals are necessary, uh, that they're a high quality referral source and what, what the different kinds of programs offer. Next, next slide, please, uh, Tish. So um, I do represent the SAMHSA funded National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, we are a um, agency that was developed by Congress uh, about 21 years ago with the mission to raise the standard of care and improve uh, access to care for families uh, who've experienced trauma and for the, uh, the children. So our, our major focus for the last 21 years has been to, um, well, first of all, understand um, at a psychological level, uh, at, a, at a family system level, at a biological nature, how traumatic experiences can impact 
um, the, 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 the developmental trajectory, the, the life growth, uh, the, the academic lives, the psychological, the emotional lives of children who've experienced a traumatic event. Um, and through this uh, wonderful network, through the uh, uh, outstanding efforts of uh, literally thousands of, of clinicians and policy members and others who leaders who've contributed to the NCTSN, we, we've built uh, resources that have uh, uh, included evidence-based interventions and trauma-informed services and public professional education really to help guide our nation to ways to assist families and children across a broad way broad array of service systems who've experienced traumatic stressors, uh, uh, whether they be from uh, 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 violence, uh, separation, uh, grief and loss, um, as well as disaster, terrorism. And, and we'll talk today about the, the, the kinds of child traumas that uh, military and veteran children um, uh, may face, as well as other kinds of adversities and the unique types of stressors that military families uh, may, may, may uh, uh, experience with, with a goal of um, providing support, anticipating what the military and veteran families might need and be able to, as a community, uh, collaborate and continue our effort to support these families so that the families feel uh, a supported uh, uh, and, and can uh, build on a sense of uh, resiliency and strength to be able to not only we hope uh, uh, persevere but thrive through through the uh, uh, any any type of uh, stress that may they may experience uh, during their military or veteran uh, career. Next slide, please. Okay, so what, what have we learned about military families during this time? Uh, just just kind of point to uh, a few of these, um, that uh, there, there are unique demands of military life. Um, that children, uh, that many military uh, 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 have, have children, uh, have kids uh, during their military career, that children, uh, uh, are born and grow up in the military, and that um, being a military family, being a military parent during military may, may itself uh, 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 come with a set of challenges as the family uh, may need to uh, move uh, often uh, during the military, that there may be separations due to deployment, but there may be separations as a result of uh, uh, training, that the military family may be one that experiences mobility, deployment, and challenges um, uh, that, that are associated with how do I, how do I provide uh, consistent parenting um, in, uh, dur during, uh, as the children grow, during a time when the, the parents may be uh, called upon to do uh, uh, military-related uh, uh, activities. We, we know that military families actually embody grit and determination, that military families uh, and military service really represent um, uh, and kind of embody a, really a sense of pride and a really a sense of strength in terms of their membership in, in their military and their service. So, Part of, our, part of our strategies, when I mentioned strategies, is being able to deliver supportive uh, uh, programs that on the one hand might anticipate and recognize that military families may face some of these stressors, but at the same time um, seek to not pathologize a military family if they're experiencing uh, a stress, but actually uh, work to bolster their, their strength and resilience during these difficult uh, challenges. So I would say that um, building support across service systems and, and recognizing uh, that um, programs should be developmentally attuned, that is that, uh, that programs are built 
and understand uh, that there's uh, specific types of uh, services for babies and toddlers. And we work a lot with zero to three, for example, to develop programs that recognize that families with young children may have a unique set of needs in terms of uh, childcare and support and uh, what uh, and connection and uh, and rest for families with young children, and that those cho um, that programs with uh, uh, school age children or teenagers might also require a different set of approaches that recognize the unique uh, the unique family needs and the unique uh, needs of those specific uh, kids. Next slide, please, Tish. So. I want to begin by highlighting some of the great resources that have been developed through the NCTSN. Um, on the left, you'll see um, after service, um, veteran families in transition, and on the right, uh, child maltreatment in military families. So these are th this is an example of two fact sheets that are available to you. Um, I'm going to be highlighting some others on child trauma. But I really, I kind of want to focus on the one on the right for a moment, the child maltreatment in military families. Um, we know that, uh, and as a, a particular area of child trauma uh, that I'm particularly interested in, have worked uh, in a, a very concerted way uh, over the years uh, to support uh, families um, that may face, um, as a result of stress, uh, increase in family violence. So this is a particular uh, area that um, uh, I, I would say that we should be particularly attuned to, and that is um, that family, military families that may uh, experience stress as a result of uh, deployment or separation, um, or that there is a, a, a family member who experiences uh, some type of mental health issue, including PTSD, might be at risk, might be at increased risk for family violence and might be also at increased risk uh, for child, child maltreatment, that is uh, child abuse. And when we talk about child abuse, I'm talking about uh, physical violence, uh, uh, neglect, emotional neglect, verbal neglect, um, and uh, the possibility uh, also of um, other, other kinds of abuses, including uh, sexual assault. So um, um, the NCTSN has developed a number of resources that are available to you to be able to not only ask questions about whether the family has um, um, uh, been in the military, but whether there is an experience in the family of uh, any, any type of child abuse uh, experience. Uh, next slide, please. In, a, in addition to child abuse, the NCTSN has developed a number of uh, very high quality resources, including these that address uh, traumatic grief. Uh, traumatic grief is um, one in which a certain, uh, in military settings, includes those in which a uh, service member uh, has been killed uh, during the course of combat or as a result of suicide once they've returned. Um, these materials provide culturally competent materials for educating families, uh, medical professionals, and school personnel about how to better serve military children who are experiencing a traumatic grief as a result of one of these kinds of losses. Uh, next slide, please, Tish. Okay. Um, these are our latest fact sheets and I would like to encourage everyone, if you haven't already, to please download these new resources from the NCTSN. They include understanding child trauma and resilience for military parents and their caregivers, as well as understanding child suicide for military parents. Um, I wanna spend just a brief moment talking about both of these resources. These resources were developed not only by um, expert clinicians within the NCTSN with expertise in child trauma and suicide, 
but also uh, working closely with military uh, family members uh, themselves. Um, the, the, the important aspects of these new fact sheets from the NCTSN is that they are focused on the uh, giving parents the, the words and the skills to be able to engage and talk to their children about these particular areas. So we have made and raised and elevated um, uh, parental engagement with children as kind of the focus of these fact sheets so that when, when a parent um, uh, has a, a child who's experienced any type of child trauma or they're concerned that their child may be suicidal, these, uh, these resources are for military parents to be able to review, understand the impact of trauma and be able to engage their child in a discussion. And these are also uh, uh, created uh, to be developmentally appropriate. So we provide language for talking to a young child, a school age child or a teen if uh, the parent suspects that they are suicidal or feeling depressed or anxious or there has been a traumatic event and being able to uh, understand the kinds of uh, uh, response, the kinds of support, ways to build resilience and get appropriate care for the child uh, if there are ongoing or lingering psychological issues. Next, next slide, please. Okay. Um, the goals for parents are to be uh, non-judgmental, to uh, focus on being uh, showing concern, having a loving stance, which would convey the parent's care uh, uh, and desire to protect the child. The goal is not to, for example, interrogate or accuse or scare or criticize the child, but to gauge what their emotional experience and thoughts are about suicide and to help facilitate a conversation. And we generated a number of open-ended uh, questions that parents can use to start these conversations on a regular basis with their, cho uh, with their children about suicidality. Uh, next, please. Okay. Um, we, we've developed over the years a number of um, uh, uh, evidence-based treatments for military and veteran families. And while uh, I'm, I'm not gonna review each and every one of those uh, uh, treatment approaches, I did want to spend some time talking about how best to frame using a military culturally informed engagement strategy, the delivery of these types of, of military uh, programs. And I'll, I'll start with the first one, which I think might be the most important one, which is to approach military families with a destigmatizing de approach related to mental health. Uh, that mental health programs or ones that are addressing child trauma should be done in a family uh, a friendly setting. That is that we do not want to uh, provide treatment in any sort of way where the family might, be, might feel as if their entry into treatment may be stigmatizing to them or their children. Um, next, we focus on strengths of the service member, veteran, or family. As, as I noticed, as I noted earlier, I think one of the uh, key aspects of our understanding of military families is that they come from a place of strength, grit, and determination in their service to the military, and being able to focus on those strengths is, is a key engagement strategy. If, if we come to this work um, where the family feels like they will be pathologized or stigmatized, we will often lose them. They will not return to uh, mental health services. Um, that it's very important to provide education for those who might encounter military uh, families and veterans like we're doing today, really understanding the insights, um, uh, military cultural training that, um, that we take an appreciation for all, but a care for those at greatest risk. 
that we, we want to be able to provide almost a universal message to all military members that uh, it is okay to seek care for yourself, your family, that stressors uh, uh, can occur as part of military life. And for those who may have faced uh, traumas or loss that we try to uh, work to, uh, especially as a community, help those families to access care, to uh, provide support to those who might be at greatest risk. Uh, perhaps we know which units or which families have experienced losses um, and, and provide um, uh, additional support to those families. Um, I think another kind of insight is one of flexibility that is really important to uh, remain flexible. Um, and what I, what I mean by this is um, oftentimes, uh, for example, when we're providing treatment services, um, we'll, we'll see families moving, or we'll see separation during, during a treatment uh, protocol uh, where there, there may be a deployment. So it's very important that we as a mental health community remain flexible in our approach to be able to meet the families when they're available. And that may mean uh, uh, our, our schedule or how we approach treatment or being able to really manage the movement and changes that occur in the military family um, as, a, as a mental health community. So remaining flexible and understanding that things do change, they can change often, and that to provide services requires flexibility. I included family-friendly hours, and I think that's really a, 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 another important approach, not only to family-friendly settings and, and a destigmatizing uh, environment, but also that um, how and when we provide services needs to uh, match and understand what could be a family that uh, is, is, is stretched, um, that could benefit from services, uh, but we need to find ways to make it you know, uh, uh, available in a way that's convenient and uh, accessible. Um, there is a great need to provide uh, or to have an appreciation for military culture, as well as other self-identifying attributes. And, and when we talk about military culture, we're talking about so many, um, uh, uh, there's so many nuances, not only understanding military culture, but, but how things work, for example, at a, at a, at a branch level, um, how things uh, work at an installation level, what, what are the, the norms for um, uh, families who've just moved to a community? Uh, who are new to that community? How do they find ways to uh, become connected into that community? What if that family has uh, 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 needs to establish new care? How do how do we help families that are moving around to different installations with a child who has um, uh, mental health concerns or other other uh, uh, um, uh, maybe an academic issue, maybe they're an exceptional child that needs extra support. So how do we understand military culture in the way that the system works and still support the family through their changes, their moves, and be able to understand all those nuances? So learning about the culture, the branch, um, the installation, and how families move through those, those aspects of the military and their transitions is really key. We need to think about a, con con a continuum of care and support. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, one of the key sort of frames in my work is continuity. And, and it, it, it's not just that we as community need to sort of continue to have this discussion, have a continuous discussion about ways to support military families. But, but the military and their, through their uh, military family and uh, uh, their transition into veteran life, um, the, they, the military family will seek care both in the installation in their community. And then once they, once they uh, uh, retire or, or transition to veteran life, will also need support to find care 
find uh, medical, psychological uh, uh, support services in the larger community? And how do we anticipate that uh, the, the family too uh, may not be plugged into VA care, but may need uh, uh, additional uh, supports. And how do we how do we anticipate provide support and education over over a, a sustained period of time? Next next uh, slide, please, Tish. Okay, um, I mentioned that engagement is really a critical is is a critical point. That engagement is is how do we deliver care? How do we how do we how do we educate parents so that the information, the the knowledge about prevention, about resilience, is is uh, is received and applied, um, and that treatment services are not only accessed but there's continuity, and that those those uh, principles, those gains are applied to uh, individuals' everyday life. So engagement is seen as a dynamic process of education, a recognition of problems, and receiving appropriate resources. Um, there's behavioral and attitudinal components of, of engagement in programs, um, but I believe that um, uh, we, we can, we can address the barriers. The barriers are the stigmas around um, if I talk about mental health, I'll be perceived as weak. If we talk about our problems, um, uh, my family will, will be ostracized, we'll be marginalized, we won't be connected. Um, that's gonna affect our career and our standing. Um, if anyone finds out that my, my child has uh, been bullied or is bullying others, that that's gonna impact us negatively. So all of those are kinds of barriers to seeking care, which could address those issues because people have such great fears about whether I disclose or talk about what's going to happen to this information. Will it get in my jacket? Will it affect my child's ability to um, have a military career? So all of these are potential barriers that military families may discuss that may prevent, um, prevent them from accessing a men mental health care, behavioral health care in the military or in the community. Um, part of our response to these potential barriers, these stigmas, these, the, the fear of being pathologized is to focus on strengths is to build resiliency programs that promote coping strategies, is to anticipate what some of those stressors might be and help families to, uh, uh, through prevention, through education, to, for the parents to work directly with their children to address some of the issues uh, themselves and to seek mental health care um, as needed when they need additional care. Um, so I really want to, to sort of make as part of my talk that these, these uh, beliefs around stigma and barriers continue. Uh, in fact, I believe, believe we all have them. We all, we all have some degree of fears about sharing and trust about some of our most intimate and personal issues. And, and, and still, how do we help military families where we know that there may be stresses related to deployment and moves and transitions? There may be stressors in the family that, that can cause uh, 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 trauma within the family in the form of abuse or family violence. Um, uh, uh, there may be trauma as a result, a result of combat. The, the post-traumatic stress disorder may impact parenting, it may impact the family dynamic, it can impact sleep, it can impact relationships. Given all those kind of issues, how can we build rationales? How can we build trusting relationships with community providers to be able to build skills by the parents, relieve, reduce some of those uh, uh, traumatic stressors, the uh, uh, reactions, uh, be able to help the kids um, so that they're 
their development, their, their growth, their psychological growth is not negatively impacted by these experiences. Next slide, please, Tish. So uh, we do and have provided uh, a number of um, outstanding uh, 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 resources that are available through the NCTSN. So I hope you'll check out the NCTSN uh, website related to um, understanding for children, post-traumatic stress, depression, the, disru the potential for dis disrupted relationships or academic achievement, uh, specific treatments that have been developed for military kids, uh, focus on well being and self care, uh, creating encouraging statements about uh, strength and recovery, as we've been discussing, and a connection to a broad array of helping uh, clinical services that are available throughout our uh, communities uh, that uh, can address crisis. Uh, suicide prevention and and foster partner organizations. So there is a coordinated community response. Next, please, Tish. Uh, thank you, everyone. I know I probably went over and I'll hand things back to Tish for uh, comments. Thank you so much, um, Greg. Uh, I can tell you, I, I love your presentation and I just love the way that you communicate. It's like soothing. Even when, even though we're talking about some pretty heavy, difficult things, it's like I can still listen to you talking about these really sad things that happen to um, folks. Um, I wanted you to say there's three things that that obviously rose to the top was the collaboration, the continuity and understanding, and um, and also language and just the continuity and care, and then the coordinated response. Those are three things that came to the top. Um, I hope you guys pick that up as well. And um, I just wanted to just offer, just based on my experience as an Army leader and, um, and having um, difficulties within my own family post-deployment, is that, you know, these high stressors, that these things that we don't have coping skills to deal with, the parents oftentimes, they're not bad people. It's that they have reached the limit, the threshold of where their coping skills um, may be able to provide a positive response. And so unfortunately that does show itself in ill treatment of family members. And um, so I, I just wanted to, to just kind of offer that, you know, it's a three, it's, it's a many pronged um, response to those negative effects of the children. We need to teach those coping skills to the service member and the adult family members like how do we deal with those major high stress situations in a productive way? And I can tell you our young service members that are 25, 24, 30 years old that don't have those coping um, skills are not gonna treat their family members, you know, in the way that we would hope. So I just kind of wanted to, that, that just kind of came to me our, in your talk uh, Dr. Laskin, um, we have just a few minutes before we are to close. So I'm going to say that if you have any particular comments or um, things that, that came for you that you'd like for us to address, throw those things in the chat and we'll be sure to get back to you and answer your question. Um, this is your homework for next time. And I'm so excited to see that the uh, Elizabeth Dole Foundation is one of your home, uh, homework assignments. I'm sure that Sean is too. And then I ask that you just look and check out all the resources that are available at the NCTSN um, website. And um, just really want to thank you for your time. Um, next time, we're going to be hearing from Nicola Winkle from Arizona and Dwayne France from Colorado. Um, both of them are dynamic speakers. I asked, you know, share this link, however you came about to this programming, you know, share it far and wide. This is the most um, amazing um, opportunity to strengthen our skills in responding to our family members and their needs. So without further ado, I just wanna thank you for your time. Uh, thank both of the speakers for um, their expertise and for sharing 
um, with us and, and just wish you all the best in your efforts. And um, y'all take care and don't forget to put any comments or questions that you may still have lingering in the chat function. Thank you and we'll talk to you later.